Thank you, Sarah, and uh, for inviting me. And thank you, Osama, for that. That was um, uh, really interesting. I, I know just before I start that um, Riyadh and Turkey have been in talks about Turkey potentially um, supporting um, with mi military and soldiers as well. So it's really, uh, and, you know, anxiety inducing the developments in Yemen. Um, so essentially, I'll, I want to say a few words about the human rights situation in Turkey and the Turkish government's politics and how the UK and Europe's support for Turkey's military interventions has really bolstered um, the deteriorating human rights situation on the ground. So I suppose it's fair to say when the AKP first came to power, it, it promised democracy and a peaceful resolution to the Kurdish question in Turkey. Um, at first, there were some kind of hopeful signs that this might be possible with negotiations um, continue starting off. However, quickly we saw that growing um, sort of Islamization, authoritarianism began to creep in with nepotism and corruption really exposing itself at every turn. Um, and now I think it's really fair to say that the, a the AKP has returned to the traditional line of rejecting Kurdish identity and rights in Turkey. Um, and particularly since the 2013 Gezi Park protests, we, we've seen um, Turkey take really bold and really fast steps which have dismantled significant foundations of democracy, um, not least undermining the independence of the judiciary through appointing pro-government prosecutors and judges, the closure of almost all opposition media outlets and newspapers, um, large and small, the closure of NGOs, campaign groups, the stripping of immunity from opposition MPs, the arrest and imprisonment of prom prominent democratic leaders, including the HDP um, former leaders who remain in prison and taking over of opposition local authorities, even in the Southeast, predominantly Kurdish areas where um, the AKP just didn't get the votes or the support that it wanted. Um, and in, it's in, in this context that we've seen huge steps backwards in terms of women's rights, workers' rights and human rights more broadly. So during this time, um, the way that this has been possible is through President Erdogan's steps to consolidate his own power and entrench his leadership um, through really controversial elections, um, which were deemed rigged, a rigged referendum, which granted executive powers to the president, um, enabling um, decrees on a whim, um, really sweeping powers that have harmed the very fabric of democracy in Turkey. And it's these, um, these powers in the politicized judiciary which have been really key tools in criminalizing dissent in Turkey and enabling um, the military exploits that have um, really been sporadic and really frequent in the Southeast in, of Turkey in particular, um, which have caused huge amounts of civilian deaths and um, and, and lots of human rights breaches, which have been, to be fair, which have been documented, but everybody who's been involved in the documenting of those has been um, imprisoned or is in exile or, or, or somewhere elsewhere. So in the last week, for example, we saw um, the prominent HDP MP Gaga Lolo, who was stripped of his MP status for criticizing um, the government's military interventions, um, and a further five um, HDP MPs were arrested and charged on um, terrorism charges in the last week also. Um, prosecutors also began legal pr proceedings to close down the HDP in its entirety, and the HDP has been a really important um, democratic force in challenging um, the AKP in Turkey. Um, and huge, there's huge criticism of the treatment of HDP, even by mainstream kind of opposition parties like the C CHB. So um, I just want to flag something. These developments all took place, these developments that have taken place in the last week, all happened a week after Erdogan announced this human rights plan, action plan, <laughs> uh, where he said, with no hint of irony at all, I'm going to read this. We will continue to stand by, this, by citizens against all kinds of threats to dignity, beliefs and values. Everyone is equal before the law without any discrimination based on language, religion, race, colour, gender, political, voice, uh, political views. Um, and this is uh, the, 
the irony of this just I, just can't be lost. This is an absolute attempt to hide its own human rights violations. And what's and what's important is not what he says on on television. It's what's happening on the streets. We saw recently Barzich students criminalized and arrested for protesting against the appointment of a rector. Um, strikes are banned. And even la just last night at midnight, um, the president announced that Turkey is withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention um, by presidential decree unilaterally, which is one of the very, very important pieces of legislation protecting women in Turkey. So um, pro-government and the uh, media outlets have really been hailing these positive, so-called positive developments by the government, but whilst also um, pushing government lines on the HCP as terrorists, as students being terrorists, as women who protest on the streets as being lesser women, and really being a mouthpiece, mouthpiece for the authoritarianism, um, whilst kind of opposition newspapers face penalties and regular imprisonment. Um, as a result of the work that they're doing. So what is the AKP political strategy? Um, militarization and neo-Ottoman ambitions are, have been prominent since the Gezi protests in 2013 and the coup and state, and a, a state of emergency in 2016. And we've seen numerous military operations launched, as I mentioned earlier, um, frequently ending in the deaths of civilians and in political failure. Most recently in the GAR, GAR operation, um, you know, a complete mess up of an operation which resulted in the deaths of Turkish soldiers who, um, who until then, actually the PKK or, you know, there, there's word that there were offers to negotiate, which um, Turkey completely rejected, but in, instead just chose overnight to, to bomb. Um, and, and really um, it's this, put, the push for militarization is about regional power, which is why Turkey keeps pushing these military operations, with, even without um, parliamentary approval and military expenditure is going up both in terms of purchase and the development of arms um, really, really, really quickly. And these, and so where, um, what, what this, one of the purposes it serves, not just the financial and economic interest, but also to galvanize nationalism and divide and rule on nationalistic lines. Um, so with, and this is boosted with an alliance with the um, MHP, which is a um, nationalist um, a party in parliament, uh, which is uh, allied with Erdogan in recent, in recent years. So, and indeed Turkey is the only country to regularly undertake military operations with its own, within its own borders. And to date, this has been unchallenged by the UK um, at all. In fact, since, since the time that I've been campaigning with SPOT, um, I have yet to see anything apart from um, Boris's ridiculous poem, which has even been remotely critical of, of Turkey. So, um, so even as early as, so if we look at how the UK government has behaved, even as early as December 2016, the European Parliament voted to suspend talks with Turkey on EU accession. Um, and in the same month, Austrian Parliament suspended its sales of arms to Turkey in response to um, concerns about human rights. And in response, Erdogan threatened to open Turkey's borders and, borders and let migrants into the EU. Um, we don't have time to sort of talk about the ethics of the refugee, um, the refugee situation, but during this time, there were huge protests against Turkey's attacks, both in Turkey and across Europe and in the UK. Um, and it was in this context that the Nationalist Party MHB began working with Erdogan as well to extend Erdogan's parties and start building this one-man regime. Um, human rights violations were evidenced um, in Jizre and other parts of the Kurdish regions which were under military siege. Um, and in January, whilst all this was happening, in January, despite calls from various organizations, including Kat at the time, um, and spot, Theresa May signed an agreement with Turkey for 100 million for BAE systems to support Turkey's development of fighter jets. Um, and they also partner up on, partnered up on a joint venture with Turkish company, I think Neural Holdings, um, to build attack vehicles. And Erdogan's own son or son-in-law um, had huge interest in those, in those companies. 
Um, and today, Turkey remains a priority market for the UK. And we can see when we look at those priority markets that the UK has no qualms. This isn't, this isn't hypocrisy even, as far as I'm concerned. This is outright um, saying this is where our financial interest lies. Um, war serves our economic interests. And we will continue to do this, uh, to do these deals for as long as it serves our interest to do so, which is why we're so silent on Saudi and, and other parts of the world. And on the 8th of March, most recently, I mean, we've seen following our exit from the EU um, that on Turkey was the first to sign a trade deal. Um, most as recently as the 8th of March, Johnson held bilateral talks with Erdogan on furthering this relationship with a focus on defense as a key industry. Um, and, and we've seen that Turkey's prominence in the development of cheap drones um, have rapidly altered the military balance in the region. Um, and this summer, I understand that Azerbaijan also purchased drones from Turkey. And um, instead of condemning the humanitarian issues that this raises um, uh, in terms of the attack on the Armenians, um, the MOD have praised the success successful operation and said they too want a piece of this pie. You know, they want they want more of this. Um, and just finally, um, before I go on too long, um, it's not just the UK um, which is openly support supportive. The EU more broadly has been much more hypocritical in this space because it's been, um, oh, you know, actively criticising Turkey, but also continuing to trade in the arms in the arms in this. Germany is a very ample example. Germany has been praised for its standoff with Turkey for its attacks on human rights and welcoming an approach to Jan Dündar who, who exposed Turkish Sikh service provision of arms across its borders to um, um, terrorist organizations. But last year we saw that even as it was criticizing Turkey's human rights records, um, Turkey was also Germany's best customer in terms of arms sales with over 344, if I'm not, I'm hoping I'm not getting this wrong, but the, the numbers, with over 344 million euros of arms being sold to Turkey in 2019. Um, and that's significant where for a country that sells about 823 million euros, euros of arms that year. Um, I think Anna might, might know more about this than I do, but I thought that was really um, pushing. So the rise of prominence of Turkey as a major customer for UK arms sales and as a partner in the development of weapons really coincides with this increasing totalitarian authoritarian regime. And it's clear to us that it's no accident that the UK government is not turning a blind eye. And despite calls for even um, the smallest amount of accountability, for what's going on it, it's been falling on deaf deaf and blind ears um deaf and blind um and a deaf and blind government um so um and it's in and it's to this end that really spot has been established so these attacks on democracy standing up for fundamental rights and we recognize that um fighting against the uh, fighting against attacks on democracy has to at its heart be anti-war to develop a peaceful and democratic solution to um, to the issues that, that are happening in Turkey and to deliver the socio-cultural, political and economic rights of Turkey's Kurds um, and wider minorities. And so we've been campaigning um, for many years um, through actively in building bridges between trade unions in Turkey, the women's organizations in Turkey through the Kurdish, through spotlighting and working with the Kurdish and opposition MPs and political groups to really um, empower and give voice to the actual movement on the ground um, and bring those both to, um, to the attention of um, parliament and organizations, human rights organizations across the UK. Um, I agree with everything Osama said on what needs to do, but trade, I think trade deals um, and the, you know, targeted sanctions, which really stop the selling of arms and the development of arms and the development of parts that can be used in arms are, are really, really critical first steps to, um, uh, to start talking about these um, human rights breaches and calling to account those governments.